So everyone, I am super excited um, and humbled to um, be able to introduce Christy Belcourt, who is an internationally acclaimed visual artist, an activist, a person who puts her actions to, or her words to actions, and um, a very widely published author as our plenary speaker today. We also should have Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, um, who will be joining us. I know it's, I think she's in South Korea right now. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping she can, she can log on too. But uh, Christy's going to start us out this morning um, with the opening to this plenary. And we're gonna learn more about her work and the stuff that she does, the amazing, incredible things that she does. And then hopefully Samantha will join in and we will hear from her. And then at the end of this session, um, We'll open up things to a public question and answer session. So if you have any questions that arise during this, this session here, Samantha, we'll let her log on. Um, so if you have any questions that, that come up as Christy Belcourt or Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield are presenting, feel free to throw those questions in the Q&A box. And then I will moderate the chat at the end and we can have a really good discussion. Um, Mado, Christy, thank you so much for being here. I'm, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So I guess I'll jump right in. Um, so thank you for that introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, and I know that we were asked to um, speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here and tuning in this afternoon. And I hope you're, you're, you're doing well and your family as well. Um, so I am just going to share my screen and jump right into it. Play from the start. And I'm going to move this little thingy up at the top. Okay, there we go. So uh, I want to first of all thank uh, everybody, the organizers of this conference and everyone at the uh, traditional ecological Ecological Knowledge Club and everyone involved and my co-panelist, uh, uh, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield. This is a, I'm really pleased to, to be invited. I very rarely do these kinds of talks because I'm, um, you know, just working on other things. And I want to make sure that uh, when I do say yes to things, it's things that I believe deeply in and I, I care about. Um, so I, I am really honored to be here today. So my, I come from a community called, first of all, Tanse, Christy Belcourt and Tikeson, Manadu Sagaig and Ochenia, Nimki Ajbukong, Me Egwa, Espanola, Me Gwach Nuigan. My name is Christy Belcourt and I come from a community called Manadu Sagaig and uh, it is in Alberta, uh, but I haven't lived there. I was raised in Ontario. I currently live at a place called Nimki Ajibakong and also uh, in Espanola, Ontario. How do I do this again? Oh yeah, I forget how to always do this thing. <laughs> I'll just switch the, oh, there we go. <clears throat> this is a picture of my grandmother, uh, Matilda LaRondel, and her grandmother, my great-great-grandmother, uh, Sarah Taranjo, and she raised my grandmother, and that's the house that they were raised in, in Lac St. Anne. The English name of Mantus the Gaigan is Black St. Anne, and that's what people normally use. Uh, this is my family. Uh, my grandmother's on the left here. My grandfather is in the very center behind my grandmother, my uncle and my auntie, uh, and my dad is on the right. I come from Belcourt, La Rondel, La Tante, La Rocks, Mousswa, and Callihoo family lines. So that's a little bit about me. Um, this, I was asked to do some, um, presentation on my art and some of the work that I'm doing uh, in, in addition to my art. So that's what the slides that I'm going to show you. This piece is called A Delicate Balance. It was completed last year. It's on permanent exhibit at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and it's part of their permanent collection. The painting contains over 250,000 dots, and it's approximately nine feet by six feet. So it's quite a large painting. Um, I think of it as, you know, the ecosystems that we rely on for all of life, we live in this balance. And our, our people still carry the knowledge of how to live in balance with Mother Earth. Reciprocity, which is one of the themes of this conference, uh, is defined in English as a process of exchange between parties for, for a mutual benefit. 
that's the English understanding of the word. But in my people's understanding of what that word would mean, we examine it through the lens of our relationships with our kin and with teachings on how to live in balance, handed down to us through generations by our elders. Reciprocity for me must be understood from the traditional perspective um, of, of it. So, um, oh yeah, this little thing here. So this is a detail of that painting. The word wahuakotuin means interconnected relationships. It uh, describes the laws under which we govern ourselves or the understanding of the values and the things that we adhere to in our relationships uh, and our kinship specifically. And, but it's not only within our family, it can be extended to be thought of as our community within our nation and within our kinship with other uh, species, including the four-legged ones, the winged ones, crawlers, the water beings, the plant beings. And so re reciprocity is more like giving back is how we speak about it, this idea of exchange. It's not always an exchange in the immediate sense, like a trade or in the commerce sense or it or a justice. It's it's not like that. It's it takes the form also of it can be that, but it takes the form also of offerings, which is things that you give to keep things in balance. And so we most commonly hear of that, of course, we know already when people will say things like I offer tobacco before picking a plant or something of that sort. But offerings aren't like a payment or an exchange of goods. Offerings are not just tobacco. Sometimes they are of importance, of value to the, to, from the giver. And there's something useful, something which, which took an effort to obtain. I was at this um, ceremony um, when in my early 20s, and it, this elder was there at Max Asinue, and he was conducting the ceremony. And he's from um, the late Max Asinue, he was from Wequimacong, Ontario. And he came to me afterwards. It was a ceremony uh, with a lot of people there who were new to ceremony. And they came with tobacco. But they were asking for some pretty deep healing and he was there all day working and trying to help people through ceremony it was exhausting for him and uh and uh, but he did it he said because the people were in such high need and so he stayed and he gave of himself that way and it was very kind-hearted the way that he was so gentle and loving with the people and helped to heal the people at this you know one one on one uh, they were they were lined up to see him privately and he um came to me afterwards and he says i i did it with just the tobacco because i wanted i want because people were in need he said but i have to tell you this because i want you to tell other people he said i have to go now every once a once a year he says i'm not i'm not the healer he said the spirits are the healer they're the ones who who heal the people, I simply ask my helpers to come and help them. I'm asking on their behalf. Offerings are given to the spirit world. As soon as they leave the hand of the giver, that is the offering. So whether that's money or horses or blankets or whatever that might be, the offering is the giving. And so you as a person who is seeking the healing gives because what you're asking for is you're asking for help from the spirit world to come and help you and 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 that means a lot it's not a little thing it's not an exchange of money it's not an equal value for mutual benefit the way that reciprocity is described in the english dictionary and this is an important distinction he said i have to make up these offerings because what wasn't given by the people in this in these ceremonies today, I have to give, because it has to be given as an exchange that is a spiritual exchange, I suppose. So I think that that's an important thing to think about offerings in terms of reciprocity. It's always a an exchange for mutual benefit in that way. Sometimes it's a petition. Sometimes it's keeping things in balance for the future generations.
when you go to your grandmother or an elder with tobacco and gifts, you aren't expecting an exchange necessarily. You're you're requesting. You are respectfully requesting. And it's not necessary that you'll get the answer that you were that you were looking for, or that even that the question you were you were asking, you'll get an answer for. But giving is built into our ways. It's very much a part of our culture. We always give gifts. We hold giveaways. It was part of our equalization, I suppose. And nowadays that would, would be called wealth redistribution. In the old days, the idea of hoarding things or having more than others or being greedy would have been considered having a sick mind. The idea that some could have so much wealth that they could fly to the moon or buy Twitter and yet there are so many people in need of food and clean water or shelter is confusing and evidence that many in the world have a sick mind. In our culture, people shared and they worked together and the elders made sure that things were taken care of and every shared, everyone shared in the process of child rearing so that no one person, either parent or grandparent, would have to raise the kids alone and in poverty. This still exists, but if we're being honest to ourselves, too many of our babies are isolated from, a com from our communities for a variety of reasons. And traditional knowledge practices are more than just environmental knowledge. In this picture, offerings and prayers for Ganebic Zibing, it's a river that was damaged here where I live uh, by uh, nuclear um, uranium mining. And so this is uh, something that the people here do, and they did this before the river was damaged. They've done it for thousands and thousands of years. The Anishinaabek people of, upon whose territory I, I am, I'm not Anishinaabe, but I'm on Anishinaabe territory. Um, they make water offerings, and this is to the spirits of the water, to the water itself, for the life that the water gives. And this is part of reciprocity. This is part of giving back. And um, yeah, and then this painting is the same. It's the same thing. It's um, it's the idea that we give to save the world, that we give for future generations, not just ourselves. So we're not exchanging for something of mutual benefit for ourselves. We're exchanging, we're giving, we're making our offerings, uh, we're making those petitions to the spirit world, understanding that we are living on uh, an earth that is both physical and spiritual at the same time. Um, I live in a place half time called Nimki Ajbikong, and it's a it's a camp that we started. I mean, you see here, this is our picture of our lodge here, and it's that's really beautiful. Uh, we hold our ceremonies. We do other things in there too, like uh, boil maple syrup, and um, I I just hear the unit. Um, and there's a lot of things that are held in this lodge. We also have uh, right now I'm behind me. I'm here in in my place here. So we have built uh, uh, year round uh, cabins or homes. It says my internet connection is unstable. So if I do cut out, I apologize. Um, yeah, because we're I'm <laughs> sometimes the internet connection isn't so good. Um, so what we what we did a group of us is we decided to come out here and build build this camp and the thing that we're mainly focused on is language revitalization uh i'm in Anishinaabek territory as i said so the the language here is Anishinaabemowin and that's the language that we are uh, even though my grandparents spoke fluent cree um and i'm also learning that language i'm learning this language too and the two languages are connected uh, they're very much they're very similar so um we're, we focus a lot on language here. We have language classes. Uh, we Everything we do has a foundation of language because we recognize that uh, Indigenous languages contain a mindset, a way of thinking that is really vital to understanding how to live on the earth. And it's important for future generations. So we we focus a lot on, on revitalization of language. Um, the Nimki Youth Collective is uh, two youth that live here full time year round, and this very grandparents' territory. Um, and we, uh, they do things like they hold workshops where they bring in uh, elders and people that have certain skills, and they are very, very much involved in obtaining these skills for themselves, but not in a part time way. They are full time involved in language and. 
obtaining the skills from start to finish. So, and not only just knowing how to do it or watching how to do it, but really understanding all of the harvesting that is required from start to finish um, and doing it so well that they, be, that they master them. And, and that's what, uh, you know, when we're talking about things like the basket weaving or the mat weaving or the hide tanning, we just started hide tanning here. We've had three or four hide tanning sessions. And all across the North Shore of which where I'm Amrail, um, there's a revival, a, a revival happening of high tanning, and it's quite exciting where I am and to see that uh, where there was high tanning done historically, and then there wasn't for many many years. People were buying commercial tan hides and using that, and now there's just like this explosion of young people that are taking up high tanning, and really learning the skills, and it's hard work, you know, and going for it and coming out with tanned hides on the other end, which are like the most expensive things. There's, they're so they're like gold, you know, they're so beautiful. And the other thing that we focus a lot about is food on is food sovereignty. Um, I'll just check the time. So food sovereignty might be one of the most important things that, that we focus on. Um, things like knowing how to keep seeds uh, raising in, we don't do this, but we, but we've talked about it, raising indigenous or protecting spaces for indigenous species of bees and, and other pollinators, um, learning practices of non-toxic, uh, forms of pest control and soil health, water health, of course, is vitally important, um, to reducing our dependency on farmed meat and fish for our protein is, is really important generally for all of us <laughs> in the world. Um, and in some cases, it means becoming part-time vegetarians or vegetarians. I stopped eating store-bought meat about since December, and I've been radically reducing my store-bought meat from factory farms and from, I don't eat any fish from fish farms at all. Um, so even when they market sustainable, it's not sustainable uh, because it's they're getting it from fish farms. And so, um, knowing that the oceans will be fished out by 2050, it's important that even though I absolutely love could eat it every day, that, uh, you know, I, and I'm just one person, but me not eating it is my way of contributing to try and help to allow fish stocks to replenish themselves. And, uh, you know, this, this has to go with traditional knowledge. It has to do with traditional knowledge as well, because when we're talking about traditional knowledge, we're talking about understanding that we never ate animals that suffered. So if our trap lines, if an animal really suffered, the grandmothers would say, oh, go bury that rabbit or whatever, if you snared a rabbit or got something that really, really suffered, because you don't want to consume that suffering. And we as a whole on human, uh, on, uh, as humans, we constantly consume suffering. Um, did you know that there's more chickens in the world than there are all wild animals combined in on the planet that's astounding factory farming is something that is unsustainable uh, there is simply not enough land to raise enough beef to keep um, people eating the quantities of meat that they are accustomed to eating and this is all, all of our responsibility and we need to to talk about it. We need to talk about how do we sustain uh, responsibly, uh, harvest responsibly as Indigenous people? How do we, well, I mean, we know this, right? It's, it's, it's already ingrained in our ways of being and knowing, so we don't need to really relearn anything here. Um, but we do have to know that like, for example, if the moose populations are down in one area, then we just simply don't harvest there. So there's, you know, I could get into it more, but I, I don't have the time to get into that more. Just to say that, um, you know, environmentalism is built into our traditional knowledge. We have the knowledge. What's at odds with our knowledge is capitalism and greed. And we, we need to really figure out how to, uh, keep going, but help along uh, people that maybe don't, um, aren't there, you know? So this painting is called The Earth is My Government. And thinking about 
Wakotawin, which is our laws and our kinship, our reciprocal nature of, of, of living, our relationships with all living beings, thinking about that and how we fit into the circle of life um, and the acknowledgement of the laws of Mother Earth and how we work within Mother Earth's legal framework. <laughs> it's not really, right? I mean, that's such a such a non-native way of thinking legal framework. But this is, I mean, sometimes I feel like we have to like present ideas in ways that that non-native people will understand, you know? So Mother Earth has its own legal framework. And we don't live outside of that, outside of her laws. In other words, the earth governs us. We don't govern the earth. And when you start to think about that and land management and those kinds of things that humans try and do, um, sometimes we break the laws that are set out for us. And those breaking of those laws has consequences as we see daily with climate change. And are people told foretold the prophecies of what would happen now the the times that we're living in because of climate change because of, i mean because of the laws that that we as human beings collectively were breaking even though we can say as an indigenous people we weren't really breaking those laws but we had teachings about these things and we knew that this was coming uh how we conduct ourselves on the land has has respect and reciprocity built in our people had land management codes built into our plans for survival it's a myth that indigenous people did not plan as ovid mercury once said in a ceremony i was in he said his his old people planned five years ahead and when i talked to my friend isaac murdoch about land management he talks about how families knew where the hunting and trapping they're hunting and trapping territories were and how the health the system the, the healthy systems of those lands were if a, if a ground uh, trapping ground could no longer support a family because of environmental factors adjustments would be made by elders or by the people sort of thinking ahead to allow or to plan for family success to plan for everybody's survival to take into account that we we, we care about our neighbors, we care about our people, we care about our community, we want everybody to succeed, we want every family to succeed, to be healthy and to get enough to eat. So these kinds of things were thought about in land management. Over here where I am, the Ontario government gives out, uh, I don't know how many thousands, thousands of moose tags, which are permission licenses for people to hunt moose they have no they may they don't have any real way to say hey the moose in this area are stressed already you shouldn't hunt here in this particular area and then give it a rest for a few a, a few years or like if the beavers are trapped out of a certain area you know you you just don't fully trap anything out first of all in our ways of understanding but in their ways you know they trap things out and then you you know you're left with none so the idea is to get, um, you know, land management, we had that built into our traditional knowledge. How can we work with governments, with other people, with non-native people that are in the town that get their moose tags and they just go out anywhere. And yet there's other people noticing, hey, this area that once had a lot of moose doesn't have any moose anymore. So these kinds of things are the things that we need to, to work out. And this is my last slide. Um, so our understanding on how to live on this earth and the spirits here it comes down to respect, re reciprocity, giving back, uh, and the laws that govern us and how to live in balance. Our way of understanding the world, we don't take more than what we need. We don't hoard, we share, we acknowledge the power that is Mother Earth. We see her as alive, as a living, breathing being that supports all life on this planet. And even the smallest insects have a role. So we, we were constantly living in a in gratitude in the way of seeing this world, the way that we see it. The trees communicate with each other. And as I said, the earth governs, governs us and not the other way around. Our people also have a way of praying and we still have medicine people who understand how to ask the spirits for help. And now more than ever, we need to return to our ceremonies. The plants have answers for us. The birds and the animals have answers for us. The waters have answers for us. And if we continue to make our offering and try to speak to the other species like we did, like all of us did, the plants, the animals, and everybody, 
and fast for that knowledge and make those sacrifices and make our offerings, the path will be made more clear. That's it. Hi, Hello. hi. I thank you for listening. Hello, Christy, that was beautiful. Thank you for um, thinking and talking to us about the consumption of suffering and intersections of environmentalism and land management and traditional ecological knowledge for sharing your incredible artwork and, and your knowledge and your time with us and the labor that you produced to, um, to be here and to create that presentation. Mado, we appreciate it. Um, we're gonna, oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, we're gonna move on to Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, who is an incredible academic. She's a research associate at Oregon State University a TEK specialist who has worked with many tribes all over the Pacific Northwest. She's joining us from South Korea right now. It's probably very late at night, maybe early in the morning where she's at. And um, she's just amazing. So uh, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, please um, go ahead. Thank you, Laura. Can you hear me? Is it? Yep, okay. you're good. You're good. So it is 3.30 in the morning, and I do have neighbors here in Seoul, so I'm going to be kind of quiet, and if you can't hear me, please chime in. Um, let me share my screen. Christy, that was amazing, and I just, I wish you could, I kept nodding. I was like, yep, yep. <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, thank you for that. That was such a wonderful presentation. It was so wonderful to hear you, and um, we are so honored to be able to have you here in the at the conference, thank you. Um, so, relevance looking forward, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, my focus is more on climate change and how climate change is framed. Um, I am in the sciences, but um, my perspective is very different from Western science being TEK, but um, it is a difficult process. Um, so, Chela, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, well, I'm not sure she did the next I am Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield. I'm enrolled with the Confederated Tribes of Solettes um, here on the west part of Oregon, and I'm also Cherokee. Um, I'm working with very newly working with the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation Science, so I'm very excited about that. So, TEK has been wrapped into a lot of projects and the awareness has been burgeoning in the you know past few years. It's it's a very new thing that um, Western science is adopting. And so we're finding it increasingly more and more wrapped in. This is a really great example. I'm just gonna jump in here um, because I have a lot of information. I wanna get it in. Um, this is a NOAA project that came out um, several years back, and they do a really nice job of outlining and defining. This was a fisheries project, but they addressed the fact that there are several EKs, ecological knowledges out there. There's um, fishers ecological knowledge, but most importantly, I wanted to point out that there is a local ecological knowledge, and sometimes that's being wrapped in with citizen science, and that's really different than TEK. Um, a lot of people know farmers' ecological knowledge or the farmers' al almanac. That's a very long-standing um, ecological knowledge as well, but um, not quite as long-standing as TEK. And because TEK is four to twelve or more generations worth, it contains more detailed and longer-held databases. Um, that information is so rich with information and. Um, it just has this depth that cannot be found in other EK systems. So native culture is rooted in the land and anybody that's really familiar with that is, you know, is it's kind of like a duh thing. But as Chrissy was saying, it's very difficult for a Western mindset or a Western set mindset that doesn't honor that reciprocity relationship to fathom that in a non consumptive manner in that capitalistic um, way of thinking or approach to the the way we are the way we relate to as natives to a system that is um, environmentally sound and balanced it's very difficult to convey that 
in the depth and breadth that TEK has. Um, so all too often we see that perceived as past tense. We are past tense as natives. Our TEK is past tense. Our culture is past tense. We see this in like buckskin representations. We have teepees that are pan native um, and very, very, very often we're considered non-modern regardless of whether we are in South, North, East, wherever we're at, it's seen as a very non-modern culture. And that's a very difficult process, even in the sciences. So I just screen grabbed these this evening even. I really wanted to have a very update. This first one on the left is from Reader's Digest. Here's the, the link. And it's 13 facts about Native Americans you didn't learn in history class. And again, this is this is the picture that they use. This is the screen grab that just was, you know, right on top in the you're welcome to go look at these. Um, most of these articles, both of these articles are actually framed in past tense as if um, native peoples are not around anymore. This native culture is something that's mysterious and, you know, oh, it was wonderful. It's got this magical quality and here's the noble savage and, but they're past tense. And obviously, you know, this one is black and white and it's got the teepee, of course. And, you know, clearly these are not modern day um, people. It looks like some picture that you know a family would have on their wall of ancestors, but the fact is you wouldn't see somebody being written about if they were um, not there um, in this manner. Meaning I'm, you wouldn't see, you frequently do not see another group of people that are written about in the past tense when they are still very much alive and engaged in their cultural protocols. So this, this right one here that you see on, on the right side here of the screen is eight overlooked survival skills that kept Native Americans alive. Um, and again, this is really ironic because these are both written in past tense language and it's very difficult to overcome that. Um, I'm not even sure if they're aware that they're writing in that. And that reflects a lot in the systems and the policies, and then the scholarship, the, the academics, the research, all of the approaches that TEK is trying to, or being enveloped into. Um, so it's very difficult to break free of that um, expectation of in the past, um, you know, this happened in the past. And while that's a component of TEK, we need to really focus on this is something that's ongoing. The past is part of the future and it's part of the present. And it's an ongoing system that ebbs and flows, but it's moving forward. And we need to really address this in a really, um, maybe blunt would be the correct term. Um, I'm finding it more frequently when engaging in conversation or, you know, engaging in collaboration, this past tense language of TEK having this mystical quality and being past tense, and it's not. Um, I've frequently talked about my father being invited to Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's a traditional hunter, and he, they were, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife were, were very concerned about um, what was going on with the deer and the deer hair loss and why it was um, happening. And they wanted to see from traditional uh, hunters if there was anything that they could, you know, information they could glean that would help. So the hunters that were invited were sitting in a room with these um, department officials and they started talking about where they'd seen it and how it was going and you know where they've seen dead deer and where they've seen perfect deer and you know their takes that year and the year before and the year before and that sort of thing and several people along with my dad my dad spoke up and he said it's a bug that's chewing on the deer and he got kind of poo-pooed and and I had dinner with him that night and he was so angry that they weren't listened to and he said that they were you know collectively these hunters were 
describing a topographical map of where the deer were dying and where they were healthy. And so if they had known, um, they could have written it down and found that it is actually an invasive species of lice that is literally biting the deer. So making the deer itch themselves to death um, or itch themselves raw, their hair falls off and then they freeze to death. So all of these components ebb and flow together. They meld with the past. They're very much in the present, but you have to be able to see the future at the same time. And I think this dichotomous mindset of the Western um, capitalistic um, perspective is very difficult to break through, but I think it's really time that we focus on that to help going forward in the future. I was recently added to a NOAA project where they were looking, they are, they're looking at crab and we had been talking in the tribe um, specifically with my dad. Um, my dad has been saying that the crab shells have been thinning and this has been going on for at least eight years. He's, he'd say, wow, the, they're, they're thinning, the crab shells are thinning and then they'd be okay. And then they thin again. And, you know, he was documenting this. And so it was very ironic because this NOAA project that I'm now on is um, illustrating that yes, and in indeed the crab shells are thinning and we're going to look at that um, in a very Western scientific approach, but wrapping in that TEK. And I think that's really an interesting component because again, if the, this was wrapped in faster, we could then help the future. And that's a really big component. It doesn't happen just one or the other. I think we have to really shift our mindset to include all of these tenses, if you will, for a better moving forward process. So with that in mind, Native people have uh, this really aware awareness of um, the land being integral to and synonymous with our identity and our culture and our history. And sometimes those are so divorced in Western society or mainstream societies that it's very difficult to convey that because there is no basis for anyone to... Um, that you're talking to that doesn't have that to reference because it, there, there's just no concept of it. And for native people, it's very, very natural. And most of us were blessed with having this or having access to be able to relearn it if, if they were removed from the, the culture. So this is a really big part of our connection and why we are so connected. Um, I remember People were just like so enamored with this photo. This is a, from a canoe journey back in 2012. Um, Ray Freiberg from the Toilet um, took this picture on one of the canoe journeys he was behind. And this is a wild orca that came up and it shows this beautiful connection and the pe how the people know that, you know, this is what happens and, and um, this is a process. But this in a mainstream setting is so the mindset is so um it's so overwhelming and beautiful and it's it's very um uh, very striking um people are just so out of touch with where they where they live and who they are their identity their history um it's very difficult and i think that's part of why we are seen in the past as native peoples. Um, it, it's just very frustrating that that dichotomous mindset. Um, likewise, this this is a horse herd that um, is was in Nevada, and the Shoshone people were talking about how they rely on this horse herd. And even now, the the horse roundups that the BLM does doesn't take TEK into consideration when doing these roundups. And this is a really present day and future um, dilemma that we're facing. These tribes are reliant upon these horse herds and the horse role that they play in their TEK and their current situations. Um, sometimes these horses are broken and for riding, sometimes they're just, you know, left and they watch them. Um, up in these hills, there are 
ceremonial sites and there are sites for gathering and uh, the Shoshone people wait for these horses to come down into the valley to graze and, and um, drink water. And they know that then um, the access routes are not frozen or, fro or snowed over and they can get into these sites. So that's a really big component. If agencies and policies and Western science really want that TEK, then it's very vital that they envelop all of the TEK, not just cherry pick. Likewise, my son, this is, this is my son and his first take, um, his um, cousin and I went out with him and um, we were looking at all these different aspects of um, how we do what we do. There were multiple people who um, came up empty handed um, for hunting, but um, we are very blessed in my family to have this wealth of knowledge. And that little black spot by the um, by the the front legs are is my cousin's puppy. Um, he's training him to be a, a hunter. It didn't go very well. <laughs> um, so it's not just the hunting or you know the collection or that beautiful um, relationship that we have with you know the living things, but it's the process as well. And that's very vital for all of us to keep that going. Um, we have to have all of this intact. Um, this is my cousin and, and my son dressing their elk, um, his elk, I guess I should say. And he was telling my auntie, my cousin, my auntie's, um, my cousin's um, mom. And my cousin was telling him that auntie used to say, well, you know, a dress with holes is, you know, just as, um, <laughs> it's just as he did to make a dress with holes as it is without. And kind of this dry sense of humor of how to, you know, take the hide off without making any holes in it so that the hide can be tanned in a whole piece. And then we can have that hide in a, in a um, very, um, whole manner and it's not um, cut up. Um, it's a really big part of how you really um, engage in some of these processes. And he learned a great deal about how and why you do some of the things you do. Um, I can't go into all of that, but this was a, a really big aspect of um, this process. It wasn't just the elk. It was the process of taking care of it and how we do that and the respect and all of that that comes from years and years worth of knowledge, you know, that's based on um, some of this information. But it also has components for building that base for the future now in the present and then in the future, cultivating our relationships, continuing that process, um, you know, fortifying our culture and making sure that this does go on and we can do this. Um, he was telling him about, my cousin was telling him about how things looked, um, where tendons were and how the meat looked and, and all of these things. So it was a very important process that was not just, yay, you've got your kill and now we take it to someone to have it um, cut up. It was very engaged, very hands-on so that that process was very in the moment, but now that will be carried forward. And that's a really big part of how that, that cultural understanding and, and TEK actually will work for the future and knowing what is expected and what is healthy behavior. So this is a really big issue. Um, some of our foods are spiritual foods. This is um, a traditional fire, um, salmon bake over the fire. And this is a really big process, knowing what kinds of things are appropriate, what kinds are not, um, what kind of wood to use. Um, these aren't things that are in the past only. This is for um, a longevity thing. This is a, an, a almost like an, um, it, it, it's an ebb and flow. It's an understanding of it happened in the past, but it happens now and it's going to happen in the future or it will take us into the future. It's a vehicle for us to thrive and survive in any situation. 
So there are many generations that have extension, extensive knowledge and the past is very vital and key. Um, it offers insight and ways to adapt as things come along. So climate change is really impacting us, but we don't have to frame TEK as a past incident. We need to look at that and how that carries us forward, um, not just in the present and reference the past. The, that consistent engagement, which is often daily um, with the environment provides great insight on changes and TEK really um, fantastic. And we're, we're, you know, all of us that do TEK are very excited that it is being wrapped in, that it is being welcomed into Western mainstream and Western science applications and information, but it does need to be shifted yet again. Um, these insights create effective ways to create um, of creation of adaption techniques. So when we as native peoples understand that how we work and how we're um, shifting and working in that um, very reciprocity relationship and that respect to build that future, to make that path, that the future is going to be healthy and walkable. Um, it's really important that we be able to see that and, and have that as an avenue of an option. And this close connection with TEK can inform offering current and better holistic data to assist or complement Western science. So that's a really big component of you know, how we can look to the future, how we're gonna open up and bring along that past and that present that becomes the past, but not be stuck in the past and be labeled as um, a culture or a peoples or a knowledge that is you know, behind us and almost um, mystical and fantastic in, in some kind of fantas fantasy um, realm. So sure, Shanin, I hope I'm under time. <laughs> I don't want to make enough time. Um, this is my information and, and uh, you can have access to it later. <laughs> Mado, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, thank you for sharing, um, sharing your knowledge and um, some thoughts about the past and the present and the future and how that all interacts with the lived realities of indigenous peoples. Thank you for sharing your father's story and the importance of concentric ecology and how that relates to traditional ecological knowledge and our animal kin and even our relationships with them. Okay, Christy and Dr. Uh, Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, if you want to both come on camera, we can open this up to a community discussion for all of our participants. If you have any questions for these two incredible people, um, please put those in the Q&A box and I'll moderate the chat. Um, our first question is for Christy, or I think, yeah, it's a question. It says, thank you so much for sharing this with us. I love your art. I was wondering what is the reason for much of your work being symmetric? That's a, that's a good question. Um, the reason why it's symmetrical is because I started by painting, trying to paint beadwork. So like on our moccasins and on our jackets and on everything, our vests, on our bags, we always have one side is mirroring the other so it started like that and uh, it was just it's a very simple answer yeah that's why but i always show underneath like i'll always show the roots and i'll show the insects and i'll show the things underneath especially the roots and that has a lot of different meanings so that means like there's more to life than what we see on the surface our roots connect us uh deeply we can't see them all the time sometimes when we're disconnected from our families our roots are still there there's they they help us they they give us a foundation roots hold the earth together they are medicines there, there's a whole bunch spiritually and physically medicinally and uh, paralleling our human lives to why I include the roots, but sym symmetry, it's just based on beadwork. Yeah. Thanks. Mido. Um, Kelsey asks, um, Kimigwich Christy, this presentation, or she just, if this is just a comment. She says this presentation resonated so deeply and I'm so appreciative of your time. And Dawn asks, Christy, why is the art dark? <laughs> it's um the, why is the art on back black backgrounds is what i think you're asking and that's because um our people well we we did do our work on 
moose hides and things like that. But when the the wool trade cloth came in, uh, our our grandmas really loved that cloth because it was so soft and it was so pliable and the colors just popped right off of it. So a lot of my in within the Métis Nation, our tradition is uh, beadwork and quill work done and embroidery done on black, uh, black and dark wool trade cloth. So that's how it started. And that's why it's there. But I like it because it's, it allows me to show off like stars and sort of the nighttime. And it, it makes me feel when I'm painting the flowers on top of it, like there's this whole other world that's going on and that they're all communicating with each other, you know, so that's, that's why I kept it going. But yeah, some of it is quite, quite dark. I, I hope that's what you meant dark in color, not dark in <laughs> Um, yeah, that, that's that's a great answer, and I do I have one of your prints right behind me, just so everyone sees. Her work is extraordinary, and um, it's inspiring. And not all of it has dark black background. Some of it is is very bright and beautiful. Um, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, I have a question for you. This one's a personal question, and everyone else, please continue to um, pass some questions into our Q and A box. But my question for you is. What does the future of traditional ecological knowledge look like um, with what's going on with the federal government right now and their ITEK initiatives? And what does this mean for Indigenous peoples and what types of concerns should we have? I think it's optimistic, um, I, but I see a lot of parallels between um, some of the land back uh, movement philosophies and moving in that direction of taking more control of, you know, TEK and the conversations around TEK and really um, enforcing that uh, perspective be held and led by Native peoples. And I think that that's happening with um, like Chuck Sams and uh, it, a lot of a lot of the people that are making change right now currently. I think that really is going to develop beautifully into the future where we, we have more power our voices are going to be heard more widely we're going to be seen in a very different light and i think that is some of the shift that's going on now that um, people are really grappling with that's it's very difficult for people to you know see us in a non-historical light but i think that that's part of the process that's going on now Good answer. hopefully <laughs> um so squally antoinette says can you post your website in acknowledgement of the work and artwork for purchase and review of the pages presented? Do, do you mean, does Christy, do Christy and, Sim, and Dr. Chisholm Hatfield have websites that, that they can post? I, I, that's how I'm interpreting this. I'm not sure if anyone else has a different interpretation of this question. If you have a website, Okay. Yeah, that, that's what that's what they meant. Um, they're both on Twitter. I know that. Um, and Christy, I think your website is under construction right now too. I was just looking for a, a new print the other day on it. <laughs> yeah, it. I just posted in the chat. Um, I don't know if everyone can see that. I, I think I wrote it to hosts and panelists. Yep. Coffee. So I just posted uh, the email where people can contact to see or get my artwork. Uh, my, my website's down. I'm just going to redo it a little bit. So it'll be down for a while. Uh, and I got Twitter and Facebook and mostly I post stuff on there. Anyway, if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, I'll, that's where that's where it's at for where I post stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, our next question actually it's another comment it says hi christy your work is inspiring it reminds me of the work on gourds and figures made in southern mexico mexico and oaxaca hmm. i i just wanted to say uh, uh to samantha i really liked your like hearing about your dad's comments on the crab shells getting thinner i mean obviously i don't like that but i liked hearing what you what what your dad your dad was observing there because i'm hearing that from all the elders around here like the fish flesh is getting softer it's um or they'll say the ice is unpredictable now whereas they were able to predict the ice uh, when people could be on the ice and when they couldn't and now it's unpredictable 
um, the birds, and especially uh, the frogs are not singing anymore, or the birds are not coming around anymore. There's a lot of changes that people are noticing. Um, and, you know, especially the ones that are harvesting on the land, these are the people who we need to turn to the trappers, the, the fishers, the harvesters, the, they're the ones that know the know the land the best and um, and the waters the best and they they know what needs to be done i think um, in order to protect areas and that's just one thing that i want to make a plug for is protections work so if if um, being um, on the front line protesting and land back is not your bag maybe running for office and pushing through legislation to protect uh, areas is there's there's a lot of different ways that we can help you know so Anyway, I just wanted to comment on that. So thank you. Thank you. I can't find my mute button. <laughs> um, it's it's almost 4 a.m. So <laughs> I apologize. Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's I think um, it's really comforting to have collective discussions. And I think it's very beneficial that we do so because it's um, Migrations are happening of species, and it's very comforting for us as Native peoples to know and collaborate. And we we have collaborated for, you know, since time immemorial. It's not like we're um, just in one spot and we never talk to anybody else. I think that's another, you know, fallacy that's promoted. You know, oh, these people are over there. These people are over there. But, you know, we had migration routes, and we had trade routes, and we had, you know, like, jargon languages and, and sign languages that we used with other peoples and so it, it's important to keep that going so that we have that continual um, health that we can continue to build hopefully we can reverse some of it i don't know or help it help heal yeah thank you very good thought so we have one more i think we have time for one more um question and this is i think can be for both panelists there was a lot of discussion about exposing non-native persons or groups to traditional knowledge. What resources or ideas do you suggest for non-native parents to help expose their non-native children to this knowledge? And Christy, Samantha, either one of you or both of you can, can address that if you'd like. Samantha, so do you want to understand? Yeah, I get. I I wanted to clarify. So, is that a non-native parent of a, a native child? Is that what I'm yeah. hearing? No. So it says. Um, it says, "What resources or ideas do you suggest for non-native parents to expose their non-native children?" So these are non-native oh, non people. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of TEK that's out there that is mainstream. Um, when I do a a project or work with a peoples, um, a group of peoples, a tribe, um, any kind of group, I make sure that they have the first right of edit. They have all of the information. Um, those people that I work with that tribe um, get the uh, right to say what is um, releasable and what is not. So when any information is out there, I always recommend that people go through people that are vetted first by a native community, um, not just flashy names or the most publications or um, I heard them and they were really great kind of thing. Um, make sure they're vetted by community members themselves. And then look at their, their process. What do they do? Do they go in, take the information and then release it for sale? Or do they take the information and, and are really transparent about how that information is released? Um, because it, it, there's a lot of that that still goes on. Um, that's not a that's not a you know those were the anthropologists back in you know 1900s or whatever. That still goes on today, unfortunately. So look for you know who is vetted, who is um, out there doing work, and how they are. Um, releasing the information and, and um, what their process is. 
So I think in addition to that, uh, I'd like to just say that um, I think that the education system in general fails uh, North American children. Um, and that's uh, a failure for all kids who are attending basically schools when they're teaching about anything to do with um, Indigenous people. And I think that that has ramifications that goes on through generations and we see it um, and it manifests in violence towards our people all the time. So it's a very good question. The thing that I will say is that the one thing that all Indigenous people have in common is our reverence and respect for Mother Earth and the way that we see her as being alive and the trees being alive and the fish and the, everything as having its own spirit and its own valid place in the circle of life. This is something that I think all peoples around the world had at one time before the Judeo-Christian belief system set in, uh, which changed people's views on on how uh, they saw themselves in the circle of life. It changed it to a dominant uh, over, over every other being, as opposed to living within this web of life following natural laws. All peoples around the world followed these natural laws. They followed the natural laws of, of, of fishing and of farming and whatever they did in their countries and in their lands. So within every single person on the earth, they have these, uh, they have these teachings there. They are there. You have to dig for them. So you don't need to necessarily look uh, to indigenous knowledges to be able to uh, understand how to teach your own children. You don't even do have to do a lot of digging. At the very base level, it's about respect and loving the earth so very much. So you could get your child involved in a protection of a river or a stream or a waterway. You could get them involved in a hatchery to reintroduce species. You could get them to know what species at risk are in your area. You could get them to um, be engaged and loving the earth. So learning how to speak to trees, talking to trees. If you don't really buy that yourself, then you can get, you know, start reading books on it, start listening to podcasts or listening to audiobooks on, on there's a lot of um, science and other based things that talk about how trees communicate with each other. And, you know, just share that knowledge. Engage your children with a love of the earth, with planting, with understanding how to do seeds, with understanding how to love the little plants that come up and, and to be gentle on this earth. And that will go a very long way because that's a gap in what the current education system is, uh, you know, not offering to kids. So that's what I have to say. Thanks. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, Dr. Samantha Chisholm Hatfield, Christy Belcourt, Mado, both of you, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I, I'm just grateful and humbled that you're both here and that you're able to share the wisdom and your knowledge and your artwork and your, your research and everything with us um, and your stories. And um, there's one last question in the chat. This one's for me. Yes, presentations are being recorded after the summit is completed. We're going to reach back out to all of our presenters and if we have their permissions to publish these recordings then anyone who has registered will be able to receive a copy or a link where they can access those but it might take us a week we're just a student volunteer club here so just uh bear with us on the time to get those sent out um so our next session is happening in about an hour i'm going to put up a timer and people Go outside if you can, be with the land, lay with the land, put your feet on the ground, drink some water and take care of yourself and we will see you in about an hour. Mado, again, thank you so much, Christy and Samantha. Have a beautiful day. Hi, hi.